So thank you very much for your interest. So even that late uh, that day, so I have, I'm fortunate I have the last presentation today and I was a bit afraid of no one shows up. Everyone is just drinking coffee and sitting in the bar upstairs. Um, I, would look, I would like to talk about one aspect that is not presented in another presentation, so it's today's, which is about vectorization or short CMD. With C++, of course, or, well, slightly related to C++, let's see how it works out. Um, as you can hear, I still have some problems uh, with my voice because uh, of an aftermath uh, cold I had uh, last week. So I hope it's still uh, acceptable for you to, and you can understand me well. If not, just let me know. So the agenda, I um, would like to give you a first basic overview about what CMD and vectorization is. Who of you already knows what it is? Okay, so I will only use those introductions to clarify some terms that were used throughout the presentation. Then I will talk about how to vectorize, what vectorization techniques are available. And, well, no surprise, I will talk about two vectorization techniques here, OpenMP and Silk Plus area notation, oh, sorry, Silk Plus, Intel Silk Plus, uh, where we have going to get a closer look into. Every good presentation at Intel starts with Moore's Law. Who knows what Moore's Law is? Okay, in the first row, what is, what is it? <laughs> the number of transistors is double every two years. Or the power of the... It depends. What are we doing with those transistors? Who knows it? One word. Game. Sorry? Game. Okay. No, no. Um, yeah, okay. It is used for game. It can be used for gaming, yeah, right? But more general, what can we use with the transistors? Sorry, more? Microprocessors. Microprocessors? Yeah, I, I mean, we already have microprocessors. Number of transistors in a microprocessor. Yeah. Oh, you're going in the right direction, maybe? Yeah, and this boils down to one word, parallelism. Okay. For more than 10 years, you, I'm pretty sure you're aware that we cannot increase the frequency anymore, or the frequency even dropped over that period slightly. That's because of the underlying processing technology or underlying uh, processor technology with the CMOS technology <coughs> is, does not allow higher frequency at a, uh, with some economic efficiency. So, of course, we can increase the frequency, but then the power consumption is just, ex uh, just suffers uh, exponential growth. So, what happens instead? With Moore's law, thanks to Moore's law, we, adding more, we can add more transistors, add more logic, and more logic means we put in parallelism. One way of parallelism you know, that's multi-core, many-core. So we're providing more cores per package, which then, in the end, turns up as straddle parallelism, or TLP. This is what I refer to as straddle parallelism. This is not the topic of today. Another aspect of parallelism, and this is what we're going to talk, or what I'm going to talk here, is data level parallelism. Per core, we can compute more, well, we can compute more elements at the same time. And we're going to also refer to this as SIMD or vectorization. There's also a third way of parallelism, which is also related to Moore's law, and this is instructional parallelism. So with adding more, and more transistors, we can also revise the architecture and make it more efficient. And in terms of threading, for example, hyper-threading or uh, providing more software threads, oh, sorry, providing more hardware threads per core, this also then can be directly connected to thread parallelism. So you can execute more software threads per core because there are more hardware threads, so more resources than they can execute your threads. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, there's also a fourth one, which is node-level parallelism. If you have a cluster, you can 
a cluster system, you can add more nodes, more systems to it, and then spread your workload across the different nodes. But this is not subject of Moore's law directly, um, and hence not mentioned here. SIMD or rectorization. SIMD means uh, single instruction multiple data. So we can, hopefully we can with that, um, use one instruction and provide multiple elements to this instruction. So instead of scalar processing, so which we have here, we have operands A and B and then one uh, instruction and then we get a result, a single result, a single scalar. With adding more transistors, we can provide support for vectors. So we can say, this here is one vector, this is a vector, and that is a vector. And for each of the elements inside this vector, we can then apply the same operation, single instruction to multiple data. The importance of um, this, of this data algorithm, vectorization or SIMD, I will just use those three words in, uh, with the same, in the same context. So differentiating, differentiating between those. Show already if, in theory, quite a rapid uh, improvement of performance. If you just consider the last four years. So if you, I'm from Intel, so I'm referring to the Intel, Intel processors. This is just an example. But other processors with Intel architecture um, providing the same extensions, so the same vector extensions also are subject to this growth. So increasing the vector length, making it possible to execute more of those vector operations at the same time, those increase the performance in theory. It is a big problem um, how to make use of that. And this is the topic of today. You also see here, I don't want to ignore that, a diagram showing just the instructions, the opcodes to be more precise, um, of the different architectures, Intel architectures that we had, of different generations, Westmere, Sandy Bridge, Ibridge, Haswell, and Knight's Landing, so the future Intel C on Phi. And if we just look at the vector, so the green bars, you see that the amount of instructions that you can execute with vectors, ma making use of vectors, increases. The yellow or orange bars is for the Scala, traditional Scala operations, and it stays mostly flat or just increases slightly. The focus on improving performance per core, so not just adding more cores, so just to stay within the core, is now entirely on, well, I would not say it entirely, I would say mostly on the vector operations, on SIMD, and it is crucial how to make use of that to get uh, good performing uh, applications. The, there are different generations of SIMD. Everything started with MMX, doesn't have any practical relevance now anymore. What you might still face in practice is SSE. So SSE has a vector size of 128 bits. So when I'm talking about the vector size, it's just the entire vector without taking into account which types I'm putting on the vector. It should also be mentioned that, I, uh, that the types have to be homogeneous, so you cannot mix different types on the same vector. So if you say, for example, in this case, I was using 32-bit integers, all the elements on a vector have to be 32-bit integer. You cannot mix it with something else. <clears throat> if I refer to how many elements I can store on a vector, it A, depends on the vector size, so for example, 128-bit, and on the data type, on the underlying data type I put on this vector. In this case, when the underlying data type is 32-bit integers, I can put, put four elements on the vector. So I can do, I can, uh, I can apply one instruction or one operation on four elements at the same time. Hence, the vector length in this example is four. So VL is abbreviated for abbreviation for vector length, and the vector length in this example is four. If the type changes, of course, the vector length can be different. AVX in 2010, or was introduced in 2010, doubled the vector size, so up to 256 bits. As a consequence, it also doubled the uh, vector length, so it can put more, twice as much 
uh, elements on a vector of the same type, of course, compared to SSE. And it continues to grow up to what we have right now for Intel Xeon Phi, 512-bit vectors, so which is also 64-byte, one cache line on Intel architecture. And also in the future, this will also be uh, available in a future Intel Xeon as well, which is then called Intel AVX 512. So, how to vectorize? <clears throat> there are hundreds of ways to vectorize. I or we try to um, provide you an abstract overview to that. So, it's not complete, so please don't name me down if something is missing. Basically, when you talk about vectorization or when you want to make use of vectorization, there are two approaches. One is you know exactly which kind of architecture you're programming for and you exactly optimize for it. You write assembler code or you use intrinsics or use some abstractions to intrinsics or some other approaches. This is not portable, of course, because um, every time you switch to a new processor, you have to change your code. You have to make sure that Larger vectors are supported. Newer processor generations are supported. This is not what we want to do. And of course, this is not related, of course, to the topic of this conference because it's C++. So we don't want to use assembler or some low-level uh, functions here with C++. We want to use natively C++ and work with it. So, and this is the top, top part here. The base or the trivial approach would be well, let's hope for a good compiler to do the magic. So, which we call as auto-vectorization. So, provide some code, some C++ code to the compiler. And if the compiler is clever enough, it does the magic for you and vectorizes the code. And, can, and then effectively makes use of the SIMD extensions of the underlying processor. Um, this is not true. So this is, in reality, this does not work out of the box. For simple codes, it works. Some compilers have good heuristics to, um, to guess what the best implementation could be, but if you're then going into more complex, more realistic codes, then uh, you will soon face um, problems that the compiler just says, okay, I don't have any idea how to vectorize this. I just use the Scala implementation. <clears throat> I mixed up those two, I just re uh, realized. So, but you can also for, um, add some additional um, hints, annotations to your code, telling the compiler, well, ignore alias sync, for example. Or um, even C++ doesn't tell you that this can, this can be um, aligned or this data or pointer is aligned. Well, assume that it is aligned, for example. In some cases, this can help to ease for the compiler to vectorize, but this is also not enough. And we figured out that uh, for real code, you still need to, well, restructure your code in a way and use extensions to make it vectorizable. And those, <coughs> I only mentioned two here, Circ plus, Intel Circ plus, and OpenMP4. There's also OpenCL, um, which we already heard talked before, which is somewhere in the middle don't name me exactly down where, where to put it. Some might put it on top here, or some others might, might put it lower. So I just put it in the middle. So, but with those here, we want to stay with C++. We want to stay with using C++. We don't want to learn another, yet another language. So, and there are two ways. Working in this, in this level, or on this level, is use a library that is optimized or that provides obstructions to um, make it easy for the compiler to vectorize. BoostSMD is one example for that. The advantage of, the, of this library is that it works with every compiler. So you, best case, it's a template, uh, template library, C++ template library, you can use any compiler. Mm -hmm. Of course, if, it's, uh, make, if you make use of C++ 2011, then of course the compiler has to support that. Um, but you might find other, other implementations that are uh, not making use of C++ 2011, for example. So it can then be um, independent on the compiler version. It has a, can have a well-specified um, API that helps the user, the programmer, the application designer, the architect to express um, 
operations in a way so they can be, uh, they can be optimized or vectorized directly. And this is very important because I'm working with HPC codes and some, well, I wouldn't say some, most of the HPC codes have a long tradition and they don't have a very good structure with regards to vectorization. So vectorization is just uh, addressed on a very low end in most cases. And a good code also addresses vectorization by um, structuring the data. And if you use a library like that, it can help you because it enforces you to use a certain way how to, how to express the operations you want to do on the data. Disadvantage of this is um, this library implementation or the implementation of this library um, in the end effect maps to normal C++ code and then it goes to the compiler. And the compiler has to then guess how to optimize, how to vectorize. There's no way to communicate it directly to the compiler and say, okay, this can be a vector and enforce vectorization on this operation, for example, using this vector. So some of those implementations ended up in providing different patterns for FMAs, for example, fused multiply adds, or for shifts, or for broadcasts, or for swizzle operations, and so on. And then in the end, um, ended up in re-implementing the architecture, the underlying architecture on the library level. And this is not what we want to have, because we want to be agnostic to the underlying architecture, so we don't want to know on which processor we are running on. Right? So we want to use the library and it should just help to vectorize it. So if I use, for example, if I, if I write code for, um, if, if I write code and I have to use FMAs um, on processors that don't provide this FMAs, fused multiply adds instructions, well, this has to be emulated. It might be slower than just doing something else, so just doing a multiplication and addition separately. So there might be some side effects here. A better way would be to tell the compiler to vectorize or how to vectorize. So you can provide more context to the compiler. Say, so, okay, aliasing, for example, is not important here. Some data structures can be aligned. Some control flow can be re reordered in some way. Um, that would also be uh, quite simple to use because, you, well, provided that there is an, a standard, of course, um, if you follow then the standard, um, it works across different compilers that support the standard. It's easy to use, easy to port, of course, because this implementation or this, sorry, this feature from the compiler, compiler-based vectorization, should not be aware about the architecture as well. And of course, the compiler then can do the optimization for you, so you, you don't need to do it. Of course, the disadvantage is that the um, compiler is, has to support this standard. So if you, for example, if a new C++ standard comes out with compiler-based vectorizations, then you can only use the compiler that supports the standard. Won't be backward compatible. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, it's not yet there in the standard. So but I will, go, I will show you what is currently available, what is standardized outside of C++, what extensions are there, already, and a little bit of a peek into what is currently ongoing with C++ 2017. But before that, I will use um, one example. And this example is based on three, top three issues with regards to vectorization. So there are typically three problems, or there can be much more problems than that, but there is a top three of problems that can hinder vectorization when you work with C or C++ code. First is data depends. And I have here on the right-hand side an example. Where is, where is the data depends? Who can point it out? A and B might be aliasing, yeah. Point to A and B, yes, right. Some, some other depends. With the offset? That's right. Those are the two dependencies. So A and B can be can alias the same memory location. 
Either A and B can be identical or partially overlapping. The compiler has to assume that. And data dependence is hindering vectorization. If the compiler cannot tell exactly um, um, how the overlap looks like, how the memory layout looks like, and how pointer are pointing to this memory, um, it has to assume the worst case. And this means it can overlap at any time, and hence it cannot use vectors at all. This is also somehow simulated, or not simulated, this is also a side effect, same side effect that is used here. If you have an offset, the offset is provided as a parameter, it's an integer, and at runtime, you can have any value. Of course, if you wrap this around in a template and you make it a compile time constant, the compiler then can provide different implementations, and it already know it, knows what the compile time, which values offset is. But let's say this is a runtime um, variable, so you don't know it at compile time what offset can be. Yet there was a question. Um, cannot the compiler um, make a case, uh, case which basically so, uh, takes the, the parameters <coughs> for uh, yep. A good compiler can provide uh, what we call a multi, uh, could provide a multi-version of this function foo. Which means, what happens if A and B are overlapping? What happens if, if offset has a certain value? If it's positive or it's negative? But if you add a lot of pointers to that, and you have a lot of Dutch, uh, offsets, then you have an exponential growth of the complexity, which kind of overlaps you have to test. And then the compiler will say, it's too complex because I have to then create 20 different implementations for this function. It doesn't make sense just to blow up the, the binary of the, code, uh, of the application. So no, that is not a solution. So the compiler, in, for this simple case, it will do it. But for a real case, it won't do it. Control flow depends. If you have conditions, so we heard this before with OpenCL. This is not, well, OpenCL is somehow possible, but it's restricted because of the underlying way GPUs work. On a normal processor, host processor, you can write code like that. And you also can vectorize it like that with the Cindy extensions there. But if it's, and a good compiler might do it already, might find a way how to vectorize this, these conditions. Um, but if, it, if you have real world code and if it's too complex and you have multiple nested conditions, then the compiler might bail out and not vectorize it. Alignment is a third issue. Um, when you use the pointers here, A and B, the compiler, doesn't know about the alignment. It can be a, could have been unlocated in any way. So with C++ 2011, there is now a way how to specify the alignment, but you cannot tell in another function, in another um, compilation unit, what the alignment effectively is. So the compiler then has to assume that the alignment is, um, well, is not known. And the alignment might not directly hinder vectorization, but it makes, makes vectorization more complex. Because in the best case, the compiler wants to, when working with vectors, load the vectors from an aligned address. And aligned means the size of the vector. So if you have a vector of 128 bit, the, start, the first element should start on an aligned address of 128 bit. Because this is the, fast, this is the way data can be fetched from memory the, fast, the fastest. Sorry. <coughs> so you want to guarantee alignment if it's possible. There are more, uh, can be more issues um, that, or more reasons that can hinder vectorization, but let's stick with just the top three here. Um, a good vectorization technique should address at least those three. And I compiled, every, uh, compiled everything or boiled everything down into one example. Just use this here, vec implementation. We have here a loop which has <coughs> aliasing pointer, which has the offset, con control flow. So <coughs> complicated control flow. <coughs> I also made some, um, I'm sorry. <coughs> ah, I was expecting that. <coughs> um, I was already um, uh, telling the compiler that, um <coughs> wait a second, please.
I hope. I already was telling the compiler that array is A, or that the point is A and B started a line address. And I was using some compiler um, and no names here. I was trying to compile it and I got in the end, oh, I cannot compile it. I was also using a restrict keyword, which is part of C99 to make sure that uh, the, the point is not overlapping, but this, this doesn't work as well. Even so, I, tell, I told here the offset can be multiple of uh, 32, so there should not be any problem with vector um, lenses of up to 32 elements, because then there would not be a, uh, wouldn't be any overlap here. So how to make this, how to vectorize this code? Um, two different technologies. One is OpenMP4, we want to take a look into, and Intel Silk Plus. Let's start with OpenMP4. OpenMP4 was ratified uh, mid of last year, July 2003, uh, sorry, 2013. Um, you can get the specification here at this link. Um, who of you knows OpenMP? Okay. You're on the right track, so it's a scientific track, so you should know what OpenMP is. So it's well known there in HPC, and it's all, it also supports not only C, C++, but it's also supporting Fortran, just as a side note. So even, so even though you hate me for that now, because I told you something about Fortran. There have been new features added for Fortran. Those are listed here. We only want to take a look into one of this feature, which is just called SIMD. And this is a data layer parallelism. There are two technologies, or two ways to use SIMD. One is Pragma SIMD in OpenMP4. And this is, the gray text is what the standard says, or what the specification says. The SIMD construct, so this is a Pragma SIMD, can be applied to a loop to indicate that the loop can be transformed into a SIMD loop which means it can be vectorized. <clears throat> this is multiple, in, multiple iterations of the loop can be executed concurrently, and this is what vector, vectorization is about. You combine uh, uh, Pragma SIMD with Pragma Parallel code. So can you... Yep. <clears throat> I have an example later. Uh, not a real example, <clears throat> but <clears throat> OpenMP is mostly... Um, OpenMP was uh, implemented with um, threading in mind. <clears throat> so with thread parallelism, task thread parallelism, et cetera. This CMD is now the first, of, first step to make OpenMP also aware about vectorization. And of course, the vectorization features of OpenMP4 can be combined with threading as well. <clears throat> and this is how you use it. You put a pragma OMP CMD in front of a loop, in front of a for loop to be precise, and this then enforces the vectorization of this for loop. <clears throat> of course, the for loop has to have certain, fulfill certain requirements, and this is what OMP refers to as canonical loop form. It has to be of canonical loop form. This means basically for C++, for the induction variable, <clears throat> only integer and pointers are supported. The upper bound of, or the lower bound, if you want to say it this way, for the uh, for loop has to be known before you enter the loop. So you have to know upfront when you exit the loop. <clears throat> and there's a limitation, uh, there are other limitations. One is um, increment and decrement. Um, operators are well specified in OpenMP4. <clears throat> so you cannot use any way of for loops that you usually use to in C++. So there are some limitations and you have to be aware about that. But a normal standard for loop, everyone knows, for int, int i equals zero to something, blah, 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 this works quite well. <coughs> you can specify additional clauses to this to configure what you want to have. SafeLan is telling the compiler that it is safe to vectorize the loop if um, for a vector length of whatever is specified here. So you can say, for example, safe length is 32, then it is safe to vectorize up to vectors providing a vector length of 32 elements. This is important for, as we will see uh, later, the next slide, when we use the example I had I show, shown you before. There is um, this private clause, last private clause, that helps to 
tell the compiler ins if you have inside a loop, a uh, local variable, that this local variable is only used inside this loop. <coughs> and as an end effect, if the loop has been vectorized, every iteration <coughs> should have just one view on this variable. Last private means from the last iteration of the for, of the for loop, the, uh, the value should be um, provided to after the loop. So if you have defined a variable in front of a loop before you enter the loop, not in a loop body, <clears throat> use this uh, variable inside the loop, and then when you exit the loop, the, last from, the value from the last iteration will be then forwarded to the outside of the loop. Linear, you can tell the compiler when you use, for example, pointers and how the pointers are iterated over every iteration. So if you have some strided access, for example, in a certain pattern, so for example, every second element should be, should be accessed. Then you can tell your step is, for example, two, so every second element, and so on. So um, you can also define reductions if you have operations, uh, reduction operations inside a loop. You can also tell the compiler which operation is, uh, applies to this reduction. So if you create a sum of all the elements in a vector, and then in the end, reduction provides you one scholar. You can tell with the Cindy, <coughs> this should be, for example, if it's addition, the operation is an addition, you can tell this operation or reduction is an addition operation, an add, and then provide the reduction value, the scholar. <coughs> Multiple loops can also be collapsed. So if you have uh, different loop nests, you can collapse the loops to make it um, to just one loop, just one big iteration. So for example, you have, if you have an outer loop, which is, for example, iterating over red, green, and blue, if you have an image, red, green, and blue channel, and in the innermost loop, you have an iteration over each line, then you can collapse the RGB loop and the, the innermost loop with the line iteration into one big loop, and then you have a bigger data set that is easier to vectorize. <clears throat> you can also specify the alignment for different um, for different values or for different pointers as well. And if you use that with the example, it boils down to just one line. We used exactly the same code as before, but put this program in PCMD in front of that. We are safe uh, to vectorize 32 elements for 32 elements per vector because we know as programmer, for example, in this case, <laughs> Offset is at least multiple of 32. Of course, if this is not true, then it would be a, it would be a, a user error here because you specified something else. <coughs> but let's assume offset is a multiple of 32. Then you can specify this with safe lamp. And then you can also nail down, specify the alignment of this, um, of this pointers, A and B, of this arrays, or is the starting address of, this, uh, of the elements in the array. <clears throat> and if you vectorize or if you compile that, you will see then, depending on the compiler that you're using, it might be some vectorization report that tells you, okay, there was another aligned access was used for accessing the elements in the, uh, in the arrays, and this was, loop was vectorized. This is what we want, wanted to achieve here. <clears throat> Cindy enable functions is another approach which can be combined also with the pragma Cindy. It allows to specify a function, a kernel, so to say, um, to be also implemented by the compiler as a vector version. So I won't read the text here from the standard, but if you have a function, for example, a kernel that does some scalar operations, you can tell the compiler for the scalar operations, please also create a vector version of the same implementation of the same kernel. <clears throat> we will see an example on the next slide. There are some clauses as well. Cindy LAN means uh, for which it is safe to, no, for which um, vector lens it should generate the kernel, the vector kernel. So you have to explicitly uh, specify that. So if you want a vector with two elements, you have to specify Cindy LAN 2. If you want a vector with four elements, you have to specify Cindy LAN 4 and so on. Unfortunately, there is no, in the standard, there is no way to automatically use the biggest 
vector length possible for the underlying data types, um, maybe this will be part in the future. <coughs> right now, you have to specify it. If you don't specify it, it's implementation specific, as OpenAP says, so which can be anything. <coughs> Linear, same as before. There's also uniform. And we see this um, in the example. Usually, every um, parameter from the function that has been specified this way will be treated as a vector. And if you don't want a parameter to be, spe uh, to be used or regarded as a vector, you put the parameter with a uniform clause and telling the implementation or telling the compiler to keep this parameter a scalar. There are also ways to create different implementations of the kernel, of the vector kernel. I want to say vectorized kernel, but of the vector-enabled kernel, Cindy-enabled kernel. Whether uh, the kernel can be called inside um, condition or not. <clears throat> For this case, masking can be used or cannot be used. And this is what this in-branch or not in-branch means. OMP just says, if you ever call a kernel inside a condition, you have to use in-branch. If, if you never call a kernel inside a condition, use not in-branch. This is what the, uh, what the standard says. Also, you can specify the alignment. And if you go to the example, it looks a bit more complicated here because it adds a little bit more boilerplate code to that. But if you have more complex kernel, you won't see the overhead. First of all, we have this vector, uh, another implementation of this vector function here. The basic loop again. Again, we use the same open MP SIMD, but then we, instead of doing just the complex control flow here, we just call this function work here. And for this function work, we specified a Scala way how to operate on the different elements. <clears throat> if, you put it, um, if you put it this way, without vectorizing, the compiler will create just a Scala version here, as it's written down here. And then this follow will just call for every element the work. For every element or return value, AI that we call the function work. But this program OMP declares SIMD, then also tells the compiler for this also create a vector version. <clears throat> it is safe uh, for 16 elements. So I have here a float, and I was using AVX, so I make sure I want to use 16, a vector range of 16. So I nailed this down here. I never calling this inside of, in a condition, okay, not in branch. And then A, B, and offset should be uniform. Those, they should be scalars. So which means this pointer here, point A and B, and this offset should be kept as scalars. The only remaining um, parameter that is not uniform and will be created as a vector is this integer I, so the index. So whenever this work is called, it will call when this pragma OMP SIMD is, pro is specified in front of the loop. The compiler will call the vector version of this kernel. And this means it will pick 16 index indices here and provide it in one call to this function work. And then you get here, which you don't see directly because the compiler is creating the code for you, it's doing the implementation. You get then 16 different uh, uh, indices. And for each of these indices, this code here is executed. And the compiler can do this very effectively, uh, making use of the SIMD extensions of the underlying processor. And of course, if you vectorize that, or if you compile that, you will see, oh, okay, it was aligned and it was vectorized. It is also important that it's inlined, because we make this function call here, and we don't want the overhead of this function call. So the best is, the compiler says, okay, everything that is implemented here should go directly into, this, into the loop. So inlining is also important. OpenMP4, what does it look like? <coughs> um, or where is it supported for? Um, supported currently with GCC 4.9. Entirely except... Uh, accelerator support. So if you want to use OpenMP4 for the uh, uh, coprocessors or for the accelerators, then this is not yet supported, but it will be in the future. And just for completeness, for Fortran, you have to go up to 4.9.1. 4.9.1 .1. 4 
For LLVM, it's not yet um, officially available, uh, but there is a branch on GitHub that is uh, referenced here. You can go there, get the branch or get the implementation, compile um, Clang yourself and test it. And of course, the intercompiler supports OpenMP4 since uh, 14.0 last year. Um, except user-defined reductions, this is not yet supported. Even so, even not even with the latest compiler. So, what will be added in the future? But also not related to CMD, just for completeness. Whenever you want to use this, you have to specify dash f openmp CMD. So, because otherwise, openmp won't be enabled by default for all those compilers. And you don't want, of course, you don't need to use openmp as a threading model. You can just take make use of the SIMD capabilities of OpenMP. And hence, <clears throat> OpenMP SIMD is the way to go. If you use a dash F OpenMP, the OpenMP runtime for threading will also be added. And you don't want that if you have another threading model. For example, if you use the C++ 2011 threading model. <clears throat> Intelsec, sorry, Intelsec Plus. Another way how to uh, provide vectorization and provide uh, expressing SIMD in the code. There are basic, basically there are three different ways, or well, one step, should make one step back. First, Intelsec Plus is mostly a marketing term, and it consists of two different approaches. One is task parallelism, which we're not talking about here. So we're not talking about multi-threading in, uh, in this session. But we are talking about data level parallelism, and Intelsec Plus is also addressing this with error notation and simply enabled functions. And there's also something else, pragma, that we will see and we are already familiar with. So let's take a look at the pragma first. We have seen this already with OpenMP4. It's exactly the same. The only, the only difference is the terminology. Instead of pragma OMP SIMD, you write pragma SIMD if you use Intel C++. <clears throat> the reason for this is Intel C++ was pragma SIMD was the first prototype of it, of this implementation. And then it was provided to the OpenMP committee and uh, asked, we asked for standardization of this. And OpenMP <coughs> then took this, added it to the, to the standard, made some changes to the terminology. So you will still see the clauses here that are covered by OpenMP, but there are some different naming, uh, naming differences. Uh, safe land on OpenMP4 is called with Intelsec Plus vector length. <clears throat> For Intelsec Plus, there's also an additional clause, and this is what I personally like very much, the no ad asset or the asset clause, which tells the compiler whenever you cannot vectorize a loop that was specified with this pragma, provide a compiler error, so it won't compile your code. Imagine you have spent a lot of time vectorizing a loop, and you want to make sure that it stays this way. Even so, you're changing the compiler, you're changing the, um, the compiler version, or some colleagues are working in the same area and changing your loop, for example, you may want to make sure that whatever effort you spend in this loop should still be, uh, still be there, which means vectorization. And hence, you can, this is not part of OpenMP4, but with Intel C++, you can use this asset clause, and then the compiler will just bail out and compile them and say, okay, I cannot vectorize it anymore. Something is wrong. <clears throat> There's an article I'm linking here, how to, or uh, what is required to vectorize, uh, to use this Pragma SMD, basically the same as for OpenMP. The for loop has to be a canonical, canonical loop. <clears throat> so with the same requirements I mentioned before. Simply enable functions. Uh -huh. We hear this as well for OpenMP 4.0. From OpenMP 4.0, it's exactly the same. Again, the terminology is different. This has also been the prototype for this OpenMP 4.0 implementation or standardization. So with OpenMP 4, it's a pragma, and with Intel C++, you just use this Degos Black or Attribute keyword. Basic idea is the same. <clears throat> if you specify those attributes or even if it's OpenMP pragma, in front of, uh, of, uh, of a function, then the compiler generates a Scala version of the function plus a vectorized version, or a vector version of this function. Side effects or the <coughs> results are the same as with OpenMP4. 
If you use also OpenMP4 or InfoSec Plus, make sure that you add this stack of spec or this pragma OMP declare to both the definition and the declaration. So if you have the header files, also make sure to add it there because a caller has to know that there is a vector version of it or not. For the definition, you need it because the compiler has to create different implementations for it. And when you use it, the caller has to know that there, are, that there is a vector version so it already can call the vector version of the function. Otherwise, you won't see any advantage. Um, the clauses for that are also similar. We have uniform again, we have linear, vector length. This was the SIMD len length on um, OpenMP4. Well, we also have added um, a test for the processor. So we can also ask for do certain implementations of the kernel, of the vector kernel for a certain processor. Or it can provide different implementations for different um, for different processors. <clears throat> there is this no mask, which is basic, or mask, which is basically the same as in-branch and not in-branch. Provide a mask implementation of the uh, kernel or not. And there are some other, there are some other support, for example, this Intel Cindy lane. Inside a kernel, you can ask for which lane, so which element inside the vector is currently, op is currently uh, the operation for. So you can already, you can also ask for that. This is also not yet in OpenMP4. And of course, SIMD lane also depends on the vector length, so it provides you um, a value, scalar, which starts from zero up to vector length minus one. So C is zero-based index, zero-based indexes. So it provides you then this range. <clears throat> How to use it? We have seen this partly before as well. So right in front of a a Scala implementation, the hint, okay, provide a vector version. You can call it in a Scala way, so no vector version of it will be used. So this is what you usually expect. If you put a program CMD in front of a loop, and put this call inside a loop, the compiler can call the vector version of it, and you can combine it with the error notations, which means you can directly provide vectors or sim something similar as vectors to the function and call the vector version of the function explicitly. And what the error notations are, we'll have a look at after this slide. This is again an overview or again overview about the implementation, about the use of it, of this kernel. If you're using a standard loop, it won't be threaded. It will just be scalar. Hopefully, the compiler can vectorize it. If you, you uh, place a progress in, in front of that, the compiler is enforced to vectorize it. This is what the standard says, but it's still single-threaded. If you use the error notations, you're explicitly calling the vector version of uh, this function, of this kernel. Or if you combine it with a threading model, here, for example, there was a question before, somewhere. You can combine it with OpenMP threading, for example, Pragma OMP parallel four, so this here should be multi-threaded, and SIMD. So this here should be um, first um, partitioned in a way, the of the vector or uh, partitioned depending on the vector length. So, what is uh, what vector lengths are provided or supported by the underlying um, architecture, and then the the iteration should be um, partitioned into different chunks provided to different worker threads. So, you have multi-threading and vectorization just in one, so, so to say, in one pragma here. Of course, you can use any threading model that must not be OpenMP4, as I mentioned before. So the last one, error notation <clears throat> extension. So this is something new. We haven't uh, yet directly in OpenMP4. There is something like that, but it's mostly used for uh, offloading data to, uh, to an accelerator, to a card, to a <coughs> GPU, or to an Intel Xeon FICO processor. Um, but you can also program explicitly by using this extension with C and C++. So what it's basically about is, instead of writing a serial loop like that, you can write in a very compact way. And for some of you might know Fortran. Fortran has array sections, and this was inspired by that. So we can provide, instead of element-wise specifying the elements in an array, you can say, 
a set of elements of an array. The colon here means all the elements in the array. So array A, B, C, uh, all of those ele elements will be used and then the element-wise operation here, the addition will be carried out between uh, B and C and then the assignment to A takes place. This also has <clears throat> an advantage because it ignores, okay, it ignores um, aliasing. And this is a great advantage to Fortran because in Fortran, aliasing is still considered and Fortran suffers a lot here with the array sections. In case of there is some aliasing, temporaries have to be created. If some ranges overlap, you have to create a temporary for that. With this annotation extensions, this is ruled out, so it's not allowed to have some overlaps or aliasing or data dependence in general. If it is so, it's a user error. So you are re responsible if you use that, that there is no overlap, there is no aliasing. And this makes it quite easy for the compiler to optimize because it doesn't take, take uh, aliasing into account. <clears throat> the syntax can be also more, compli more complex, I'm gonna say complicated, more complex, more flexible. Instead of just using the column, which means all the elements in this array, you can also say start index and then the number of elements you want. Start at index zero and then I want three elements. So then you get a subset vector with three elements can also specify a stride, which means that uh, the distance between the elements you want to fetch. So you can say, start at index zero, then three, so which means three elements in total, and I want a stride of two. Then you get three elements in total with a difference of two, uh, with a difference or a distance of two. So every second element will be fetched. And this can be very, uh, this can be uh, expressed easily in a conscious way. Conscious way by using these array notations. And as you see here, this is an example, A0 to N. If you specify this, then you get N, N different elements ranging from zero to N minus one. This are some, uh, some further examples <clears throat> and how we can use it. You can do a normal assignment. You can fetch from A, you can fetch a subset, then assign it to B. It also works in a multidimensional array, so you can just get one column by just writing that here, for example, all elements in one column, sorry all, em oh, sorry, all elements in a row from the fifth column. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, all elements, so the whole entire column should be assigned to array B, and then it's like that. <clears throat> Using stride, strided access is also possible. You can say, for example, I want every second element, so zero, two, four, and so on, to be assigned to it. Of course, this is very inefficient because um, strided, um, non-unit stride access is, is an issue because you have to fetch still the same data um, in the architecture or underlying architecture. And you're wasting here in this example, uh, wasting 50% of your memory bandwidth. But it is possible and you can express it this way. Which operators can be used on those error notations? Well, there is a set of overloaded operators, as mentioned here. All of those operators are element-wise. So each of the elements specified here are element-wise operated or element-wise transformed, depending on the operator. Multiplication, addition here in this example. Of course, the ranks and the sizes of the sets of this error notation should be identical on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So if you mix them like it's like happened here, so here on the, left, on the left hand side of the term, you have four elements in the first dimension and two elements in the second dimension. On the right hand side of the term, you have then only for the first dimension, two elements and four elements, and this does not match up. So this has to be taken into account and you will get, um, depends if it's, if it's a constant, you will get a compile time error if you can also use not only constant, you can use any variables at runtime, but then you might get incorrect results. So you have to be aware about that. You can also use cons, uh, scalars and just broadcast them to all the elements in the array. So for example, here add the same constant C to all the elements of this array A, which is a two dimensional matrix and just a subset of this, of this matrix. 
There are uh, other ways how to reduce multiple elements of a vector, or sorry, of an array. So if you have, for example, an array A, one, one, two, three, four, elements one, two, three, four, and you make, uh, create the sum of all those elements, you do an add reduction, which has a specific, um, well, a specific, uh, what is it called, operator, reduction operation, and, and then you just provide the subset of the array you want to reduce with the operation. So I want to reduce this with the addition operation, so with the add operation, for all those elements specified here. In this example, the sum is then 10. One plus two plus three plus four is 10. Of course, you can also specify um, your own implementation of a reduction, which has been shown here. So for example, you can say just reduce. You have to have provided an identity element. Then you specify the elements you want, the subset you want to be subject of the reduction. And then the function that should do the reduction, which is specified, for example, here, which is just here, the same as the reduction add, re-implemented here. Uh, but you can also pr uh, provide your own implementations for reduction. Missing Sorry? Missing current places? Yep. That's right, yeah. I have to, I'm going to fix that. There are missing, uh, bra curly braces are missing here. At least you're still awake. <laughs> there are um, a lot of other reductions available. Some of them are listed here. You can ask for what elements are, how many elements in the vector are zero. You can multiply, you can find a minima, maxima, and so on. There's a specification, which is currently version 1.2, available. So it's documented how this works, how this should work. And we will see later that different other compilers support this as well, meanwhile. Back to our example. If you used the error notation extensions, I'm, for the example, I admit that this is not the best way to use them. There could be, could be other ways, but this is one possible implementation, which showed good results as well. Um, here, alignment is not taken into account with the error notation. That's, that's a downside. So there is no way to address alignment, so I have to use the compiler-specific extensions to tell that in this function, pointers A and B are studying an aligned address here. Base, base address is 64 byte. But then, instead of a for loop with element-wise operation, I can just write the same, func same loop body with the error notations. So I specify just the set. For this set, I uh, for this result set, I want, to, I want to get or I want to store in memory. <clears throat> I'm executing this code here depending on, I can also use conditions with that, with vectorization which test, tests then every element, whether it's bigger than zero or not, or bigger than one or not. And depending on that, it will use the consequence or the alternative. <clears throat> if you take a look how the compiler, uh, how the compiler effectively does, how the implementation, it will use masking. So we create first a mask for which elements in my vector this condition is true, for which it is not true. It will then execute this operation and this operation, and then select which elements should, should be then assigned to the left-hand side. And this is a very compact way how to express it. I admit it's not the best, best way, but it was just, it wasn't just one minute, I just wrote it down and it showed very good results, so why should I change it? That's true, by the way, also for the other examples. For simple enable functions, for example, I'm pretty sure you will find a lot of other implementations that might even work better than what I'm showing you here. Uh, you said that uh, long side is <coughs> to use uh, compiler specific uh, assumption, but uh, is uh, silk uh, array notation is not compiler specific? <coughs> but it's not compiler specific. Um, it's not standardized. Hence, you require, uh, hence, a certain compiler is required that supports it. What is your question? Uh, yep. We'll come to that on the next slide. <clears throat> if you compile it and you, get, you take a look at whether it was vectorized, in this case it was vectorized, 
And I also have a test where I show, I can show you if you don't trust me, I can show you that the different implementations all have the same, um, same quality of factorization. Um, and can also show you the difference from the original example, how the runtime changes. So the quality of the, of the vectorization here is quite well for this example. Of course, you have to figure out different ways how to express the vectorization in the high-level language, but at least it's possible. And for which compilers it's possible? Again, GCC 4.9 has the extensions for SIG+. For LLVM, again, there is another branch available. It's called not um, OpenMP, it's called SIG+ here. For both GCC and LLVM, for this branch, you have to enable the silk extensions. So you have to say F silk plus when you want to make use of the annotations. And of course, in the compiler, because from beginning with 12.0, because we invented this technology. Summary. Well, Outlook. First, now, basic Outlook. What SIMD support is, well, what uh, working groups or what drafts are currently there addressing SIMD? For C++. As I mentioned before, there are two basic approaches. One is using a library, abstract the SIMD op, uh, vectorization on a library level, and this is addressed by those two drafts here right now, which might make it into C++ 2017. But this do, those don't have, what I've shown you here, any interface to the compiler. So it's just using the existing language, extensions or the language uh, features, and tries to re-implement in a structured way SIMD operations. <clears throat> For compiler-based vectorization, there is a working draft, which is this one here, run by two colleagues from mine, which are currently trying to provide an interface in the language for the compiler to influence vectorization of the compiler in a way that it's still architecture independent and of course compiler independent. Because you don't want to have in the standard something that is not supported on other architectures or for other compilers. And in parallel to that, there's still OpenMP and this still worked on. So with OpenMP4, this was the first incarnation of providing SIMD support. There's still with next versions, still more to be uh, provided in the future. So what will be there with 2017? If C++ 2017 will be there, we don't know yet. Still in the works. The only way you can address vectorization right now is, well, use SIMD Boost, for example. Maybe use the prototype implementations here. Use open, what OpenMP provides. Again, you must not use the uh, threading model from OpenMP can mix it with any other threading model, but you just use the SIMD extensions from OpenMP or use the Intel SIG Plus extensions. But then you require, of course, a compiler because this is not yet standardized. <clears throat> so to summarize, I think, this is my personal opinion, that we need both. We need um, support for SIMD in a library. We need to make sure that users creating code, programmers, architects, and so on, and provide or implement code in a way, or design, way, design code in a way that is structured, that operations are done in a structured way that is vectorization. And on the, other hand, on the other side, we still need support from the compiler or we still need to influence how the compiler can vectorize or should vectorize code. Whether it's the way I just shown you with OpenMP or with Intel SIG Plus, that's another, that's another question. So the community in, uh, in the end will uh, decide what is applicable, which kind of technology is missing. So we for sure will see first support on a library level because that's easier to implement. And then maybe it turns out some additional extensions are needed in the standard to control vectorizations in the compiler. And then compiler-based vectorization will also be part of C++. In the end, we need vectorization right now. And for us, because I'm working in the HPC domain, vectorizing codes is very problematic. And there is no good answer yet. 
So we cannot say, if you're using C++, use this technology. Unfortunately, this is not yet, um, there is no silver bullet yet for this. But we have focus, or we, have, we are aware, so Intel is aware about that, and we're spending some, some heads working on that to make sure that there will be an answer in the future, a standardized answer. There are answers already, but it's not yet entirely standardized if you just uh, ignore OpenMP for a while. So this is the end of my presentation. So I don't know how many time we have left, okay. I, st I still will be here today and also tomorrow, so in case you have uh, additional questions, um, or if you want some proofs that whatever I t told you here is working, yes, I have something that is working. So uh, you, can, uh, you can ask me then, showing you, dem demonstrating you, or we can just work together and find some other ways to implement things. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy yeah, the the evening and of course tomorrow as well.